church family a joy to gather with you remotely here again today trust that you are well trust that you are staying connected in appropriate ways and looking forward to opening god's word together uh, we want to begin a bit of a, a new series today because we want to we want to acknowledge the fact the reality that god's got us on a journey whether that's our individual lives, whether that's our life as a church, or even nationally right now and globally, we recognize that our sovereign God is at work, that we are on a journey, but it's not always easy. In fact, there, there's incredible difficulties along the way. I was reminded recently that my family and I, a few Christmases ago, we took a really long journey. In fact, over about a 10 day span, we took about a 4,700 kilometer journey. Uh, we were celebrating some great things, celebrating my parents' 50th wedding anniversary. Uh, our son had just started university, and so we were going to pick him up for Christmas. Uh, we were traveling to Pennsylvania to see Susan's family. So, so we were really excited about the destinations. We were really excited about the journey God was taking us on. But here's the reality. In order to get to the destination, we had to take the trip. And the trip wasn't always easy. We had issues with weather, we had some issues with illness, we had issues where on the 401, I think we went about a kilometer and a half over an hour span. Sometimes, even though the destination before us was exciting, the trip to get there was really difficult. And so over the next number of weeks, we want to open God's word together and we want to look at a particular season in the life of the nation of Israel. They had before them an incredible destination. God had promised that he was going to take his people out of Egypt and take them to the promised land. And so it was an incredible destination they were walking towards. But right in the middle of that destination, right in the middle of that journey rather, there was this thing called the desert. And it's there in the desert we want to take some time with the people of God to see what it was they learned about themselves, what it was they learned about God. Uh, God revealed himself to them in incredibly powerful ways. And I believe that can be true for us as well. So God has redeemed them. God has redeemed us. He's revealed himself to them. He will reveal himself to us. And I want us now just to take a minute to pray together and ask that even through this study, we would experience the presence and power and peace and, and just wonder of God afresh and anew, even though we find ourselves in a bit of a difficult part of our journey here on earth. So let's pray together. So Father, we thank you that we can gather like this uh, through the wonder of technology, through digital processes. And, and Lord God, we, we know that that doesn't restrict you. So we pray that as we open your word today, that you, Holy Spirit, would touch our hearts with, with the truth of God, that you would move us, that you would grow us, you would mold us, you would shape us, that we truly would be the light of Jesus in this world in which we live. May we reflect to people the hope, the joy, the peace, the trust we have in you, Jesus, as we journey through this life. And we ask this in your name. Amen. So I want to begin really by, by looking at this first point, and it's simply this. We all have to understand that God has us on a redemptive journey. And in order for us to understand that, just bear with me for a few moments, but I want to set up the, the context of our study over these weeks to come. So there's, there's three primary players that we're going to see over and over again within these stories. Uh, the first one, of course, is the Lord himself. It's, it's Yahweh, the self-existent great I am. The second one is Moses. Now, Moses was, was a man that God had raised up to lead his people both out of slavery into the desert, ultimately to the promised land. And so Moses is also going to be a key player within our account. And then the third key player is the nation of Israel themselves. This is a multitude of God's people that had been set free from slavery in Egypt that God now was moving through the desert into and towards the promised land. Now, they're going to be a big part of our story as well, and we're going to learn a lot actually about ourselves through both Moses and the nation of Israel themselves. 
Also, in order for me to kind of set the context of what we're studying here, let me just walk you through real quick. We're actually going to be studying out of the book of Numbers, but, but let me just give you very, very briefly uh, the outline from an Old Testament book called Exodus, because it just helps bring us up to the point that I want us to look at here today. So we learn from Exodus chapter 1 through 3, we're introduced to one of the characters, and that is, of course, the Lord himself. Yahweh reveals himself to our second character by the name of Moses. And, and the two have an interaction together where God reveals himself as the great I am, again, the self-existent, the, uh, the, the all-sovereign God of the universe. And he calls Moses to a very certain task. And this task Moses has been called to is to represent God before the Egyptian Pharaoh in order to see God's mighty hand redeem that is set free his people from bondage and slavery. As we move into Exodus 4 through 19, we see that there's a bit of a, a hiccup in this plan, so to speak, in that um, Moses ends up running and escaping out into the desert. He, he murders an Egyptian. He is fearful for his life. And before he even meets God out in the wilderness, he is on the run now. And so for about 40 years, Moses is acting and living out his life as a shepherd in the wilderness. But of course there, God calls him. Ultimately, towards the end of Exodus, returns the whole story of how God redeems his people uh, through, through the plagues put on Egypt, through we're introduced to the Passover, that is where the blood of a lamb over a doorpost saves, rescues, covers a household so that they are saved. And ultimately, God leads his people through uh, a sea out into the desert, uh, saves them again from the Egyptians. Just this beautiful, beautiful story of God's protection and leading within the nation's life. While out in the desert now, they end up at a mountain, Mount Sinai. It's called the Mountain of God. And there at the Mountain of God, they, they end up staying put for a little while. And it's there that God really begins to reveal himself to his people. It, it, it's eventually the place where, where the, the Ten Commandments would be given, where, where Moses experiences the very presence and, and glory of God. It's in these moments now that they've been led out of captivity. The destination is still before them, but God has some work here in the desert to do amongst his people. And so I want us to understand that both for the nation of Israel, but also for us, God has us on a redemptive journey. Now, for us, the, the, the people of Israel, it, it's actually quite reflective in our lives as well. For you see, the Bible teaches us that we as human beings, we also are enslaved. We're enslaved to sin. We're in bondage to sin. And like the people of Israel, there is nothing we can do to save ourselves, to rescue ourselves from that. But God, in his grace and in his love, he sends forth a rescuer. And that rescuer is, of course, the person of Jesus Christ, God the Son, who willingly came and took on flesh, shed his own blood so that we could be covered, we could be forgiven, we could be atoned, and ultimately for all who believe, all who call upon the name of the risen Lord, we too will be, the Bible says, redeemed. We too will be set free from our sins. And now, as the followers of Jesus Christ, we too now are on a redemptive journey. We know what our destination is. Our destination ultimately is eternity with Jesus. We're awaiting glorification. But in this process called life, in this journey we are on, God is also sanctifying us. That is making us holy, setting us apart to become more and more like Jesus. And that's a process. And sometimes that process is difficult. Sometimes the journey, again, is difficult. And so it's really good for us to understand that even as, as things like we are experiencing now in our world come upon us, God and his sovereignty is still in control. And he's wanting to use all of it to mold us, to shape us, to make us more like him. And really our response is key. So understand that you are on a redemptive journey. I could not help but think about this great verse. And it's just simply this from Philippians 1.6. And I am sure of this, 
that he who began a good work in you, all right, God has begun a good redemptive work in you. Philippians goes on to say, he will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So I want you to be sure of something today, all right? In this world of uncertainty, I want you to be sure of at least one thing today, and that is this, that God who began a good work in you, he will bring it to completion. And so our response to that truth is crucial. Here's the second point I'd like to make here today, and it's simply this, that God will reveal himself to you on your journey. God's going to reveal himself to you on your journey. He's released you into a redemptive journey, and he will reveal himself to you. I'd like you to take your Bibles with me, and we're going to spend a lot of our study here in the book of Numbers, Old Testament book, just a few books in in the Old Testament, and I want you to get to Numbers chapter 9. And today we're going to focus in on verses 15 through 23 of Numbers chapter 9. So take your Bibles, get find it on your digital device, and we're going to explore Numbers 9 here together. But, but I just, again, remind you of this historical overview. All right, they're, they're out in the wilderness. They're at the base of a mountain. God has, has given them the Ten Commandments and instructions on to be holy as, as he is holy. Moses has experienced the very presence of God. They've seen the glory of God shining upon his face. Uh, plans around the tabernacle, the house of God, uh, how that was to be built and all the, the intricate details were given and followed by, by God's people. And the book of Exodus actually ends with, with these words. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. That's Exodus 40, 34. And so they're out in the desert. God's revealed himself to his people, but not only revealed himself to his people, but he's now present. He's present with his people. Now, I want you to keep all that context in mind as I read for us Numbers chapter 9, and let me just pick it up in verse 15. Again, remember, bottom of the mountain, tabernacles built, glory of God, presence of God is in their midst, and we get a little bit more detail now as to what that means. So in Numbers chapter 9, verse 15, we read this. On the day that the tabernacle was set up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, the tent of testimony. And at evening, it was over the tabernacle like the appearance of fire until morning. So it was always the cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. And whenever the cloud lifted from over the tent, after that, the people of Israel set out. And in the place where the cloud settled down, there the people of Israel camped. At the command of the Lord, the people of Israel set out. And at the command of the Lord, they camped. And as long as the cloud rested over the tabernacle, they remained in camp. Even when the cloud continued over the tabernacle many days, the people of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and did not set out. Sometimes the cloud was a few days over the tabernacle, and according to the command of the Lord, they remained in camp. Then according to the command of the Lord, they set out. And sometimes the cloud remained from evening until morning, and when the cloud lifted in the morning, they set out. Or if it continued for a day and a night, when the cloud lifted, they set out. Whether it was two days or a month or a longer time that the cloud continued over the tabernacle abiding there, the people of Israel remained in the camp and did not set out, but when it lifted, they set out. Now let me just stop there. It's actually a lot of repetition, but it's really saying the same thing, and it's simply this, that God promised to lead them. God had revealed himself to them. He had presenced himself right there with them, and they recognized him as fire at night in a cloud by day, and he promised to lead them. And all they had to do was watch. They had to observe, and when the cloud moved, they move. When the fire move, they, they move. Whether it was a day, two days, a month, a year, they followed the Lord as he led and revealed himself to them. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I really got thinking about this a lot because one of the questions we will often hear, we ask ourselves, it's really around this idea of how, how can I know God? How can I know God's presence? How can I know when God is revealing himself to me? How, how can I know when to move, not to move? What is he asking me to do? And those are all great questions. But here's something I discovered a number of years ago that was true in my own life. And it's simply this. 
I think sometimes we have a, have a hard time seeing God's revelation of himself to us because sometimes we're actually just too busy for him or maybe busy with a whole lot of other things. I know it was true in my life. I was actually incredibly busy for God and yet at the same time not resting or, or taking the time to actually hear from God. And so it's one thing to be busy for him, but it's another thing to really understand his presence. It's another thing to really understand how it is God is looking to reveal himself to you. And so I want to encourage you that even in and through this season, we find ourselves where, we, where we've been forced, in essence, to not be so busy, not be so out and about, not so consumed with our daily uh, rhythms and, and routine. A lot has been shaken up in our lives, but I really want to encourage you in this season to maybe discover some new rhythms, some new rhythms where you actually turn off your device, limit the screen time, limit, limit your screen time, and look for ways to be still and know that He is God. I want to encourage you, be in the Word of God. Yield your life to, to the work of the, the Spirit of God. Make sure you're taking time to pray. Make sure in, in appropriate ways you're, you're, you're connecting with and engaging with other followers of Jesus and, and allowing others to speak into your life and to, to hold you accountable. I mean, honestly, even sometimes God manifests himself in very special, miraculous ways. My point is simply this. I promise you, I believe with all my heart that if you will walk in obedience to the Lord, if you will be still, if you will watch, if you will listen, if you will wait upon the Lord, I believe with all my heart that even in this season that seems so difficult, God will reveal himself to you in very powerful ways. We just have to be willing to see and recognize him. I know it's not necessarily a fire by night and a cloud by day, but God will reveal himself to you. Here's another point I want to make. It's simply this. God also wants to move you so that you don't settle. Part of the importance of, of seeing God reveal himself to you, part of hearing from God, is because he wants to keep moving. Remember, you are on a journey. And any part of a journey is ultimately trying to get to a destination. And in order to get to a destination, you have to move. Now, at this point in, in Israel's redemptive journey, like I said, they've experienced the power of God. They've experienced the holiness of God. They've experienced the provision of God, the discipline of God. And at some levels, they're somewhat settled now at the base of the mountain. And it actually would have been very easy for them to grow complacent and just stay put, say, hey, we're out of slavery, we're out of Egypt, this isn't too bad in the desert, God's providing for us, maybe we should just stay put. But God knew he had something better for them. Even though they were experiencing good things, God's best for them was still uh, a ways to come. It was still the destination. That destination, of course, for the Israelites was the promised land. Here's the reality for us. It, it's, it's true for us as well. This world is not our home. We, we are to be living in light of eternity. We need to be longing for, looking for the day we will see Jesus face to face. But if we're brutally honest, we don't always like to move either. In fact, we're, we're actually very comfortable settling. I want you just to, to keep your finger in Numbers chapter 9, but I want to turn over uh, to the next book in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy. I want you just to look at, at verse, uh, verse 6 of chapter 1 with me, because it speaks to God's heart. He, he wanted them to ultimately move from the mountain and move towards their ultimate destination. Look at verse 6 with me of Deuteronomy chapter 1. Then the Lord God said to us in Horeb, I love this next line, you have stayed long enough at the mountain. Turn and take your journey. Go to the hill of the Amorites, to all the neighbors in Rabbah, in the hill country and in the lowland and in the Negev, and across by the sea coast, the land of the Canaanites, and Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river of Euphrates. And then I love this promise. See, I have set the land before you. 
Go in and take possession of the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and to give to them and to their offspring after them. Verse 8 is the key. God says, I, I can't have you staying at the mountain. Why? Because I have set before you the promised land. The land that I have promised to Abraham, your, your forefather, it's there for you to take. It's, it's there for you to take. Listen, he didn't want them stuck at the bottom of the mountain. He didn't want them settling there. In verse 6, he says, look, it's time to move. Can I just again encourage you with this truth? You and I, we are on these redemptive journeys. And again, if we're brutally honest, we can really get stuck sometimes. Sometimes we're quite content to just settle with, with what we have, with how we've currently experienced God. And I just want to encourage you today with this truth. God wants so much more for you. He's not done with you yet. Part of this journey we are experiencing even now in our country is, is I believe with all my heart, God's desire to continue moving us and molding us and shaping us and using us all for his glory and honor. But we can't be willing, willing to settle. We've we got to be ready to move as God moves. I think one of the, the greatest examples I've ever seen of this in my own personal life, I can think back to almost 20 years ago now when, when Susan and I were leading a, a small church plant in Kincardine. We really were sensing that it was time to move uh, physical locations. We were meeting in a school at the time and, and we felt it was time as a church family to actually get some property and, and build a church. And so for months, we as a leadership, we, we worked at it, we worked with realtors, we did our best and everything we tried just kept falling, falling through. And at one point we were ready just to, to give up. And then we were really encouraged to, we, we, we don't want to settle. We believe God actually has more for us. And so as a people, we just started praying. We just started praying by faith that, God, we believe you've got something better for us. Would you reveal that to us? And, and in a matter of weeks, I'll, I'll never forget this. The day I got the phone call from the city of the, well, it wasn't a city, the town of Kincardine. And they called up and they said, we want to give the church free land. We will service it. We want land. We want to give you this land. We want you to develop a place of worship right here within our town. Incredible miracle of how we, we at some levels were ready to, to settle. We'd done some work. It wasn't going well. We thought, ah, oh, maybe we'll just sell. And then when we prayed, when we trusted that God wanted to move us into something better, he provided in ways we would have never experienced. Listen, some of you are settling to live in your fears right now. Some of you are choosing to settle and live in your fear right now. I want to encourage you, God on your journey, even in this season, wants to move you to a place of trust and peace of heart. Some of you right now, you're, you're settling in some really poor and maybe sinful behaviors, maybe some sinful addictions. And I want to encourage you today. God wants to move you. He wants to move you to a place of freedom, to a place of joy, to a place of, of hope and life and fullness of life in, in Jesus. Some of you, you're, you're living still in your woundedness. You're settling to live in a place of woundedness. And I again want to encourage you, God is a healing God, a loving God. He wants to, to bring healing and, and redemption and hope to your life. Are you going to choose to settle in your woundedness or choose to move forward in and out of that by forgiving others? Some of you within your marriage or some of your relationships within families, you're thinking to yourself, well, I guess this is just the way it is. And I want to encourage you today in your journey, not that it's easy, not that it will be easy to move out of, but don't settle. Believe that God's very best is still before you if you will yield your life to him and yield um, your marriage, your home, your family to him. Listen, this <laughs> we're going to experience things along our journey that we never expected. Sickness, unemployment, broken relationships, uh, pandemics that we're walking through. These are never things we expect or even want to have to walk through. But the reality is God, remember where we started all the God is faithful. He is faithful to complete that which he has started in you. And my heart for you, the worst thing you can do even in and through this season is stay stuck is to just settle and say, this is the way it is. This is who, 
God wants to keep working in and through you uh, in this season as well. Here's just my final thought for today. It's simply this. Not only has God got us on a redemptive journey, not only is God revealing himself to you, not only is he wanting you to move and not settle, he's calling us to something today. And what he's calling us to, and I know this is going to sound so simple, but it's right here in the text that we're going to read in a moment. He's calling us to trust and follow. He's simply calling us to trust and follow. Look back in Numbers chapter 9 with me at verse 23. We read this. At the command of the Lord they camped, and at the command of the Lord they set out. They kept the charge of the Lord at the command of the Lord by Moses. It's so simple. If God said move, they moved. If God said stay put, they stay put. You say, is there more than that, Tim? Honestly, no. God had revealed himself, and he says, when I move, you move. When I stay put, you stay put. And the Bible tells us there, that they kept the charge of the Lord. And so really, here's, here's my key question for you today, and it's simply this. Do you trust God enough to obey him no matter what? As you follow him, no matter what he allows into your life and in this world, do you actually trust him enough to obey him? Are you even hearing him so that you can obey him? I'm going to be honest again, you know, as I've reflected on all that's going on in our world and even my own life, and when I think about the weaknesses or the things that cause me fear or unrest, at the end of the day, I got to be brutally honest and say, it's because I really don't trust God to get it right. You see, we have a real problem and it's that we're selfish. We love to be self-sufficient. We love to be in control. And at times it really becomes about our glory and our life and our comfort. And God is saying we got to be willing to die to all that. As those who have been redeemed, as those who walk in relationship with them, as those who have this confidence that he who started a good work will complete, we really have to learn to hear from God as he reveals himself to us and to just, just oh, that simple trust and to follow God as he leads. So maybe for some of you here as we begin this series, it's really as simple as this. It's really an affirmation, an affirmation before the Lord that says, Lord God, I recognize. I recognize that you have me on a redemptive journey. I recognize that there are going to be desert seasons in this journey. But through it all, I am going to trust you. That if you tell me to move, I'll move. You tell me to stay, I'll stay. God, you asked me to do this, I'll do that. Are you still enough to hear the voice of God as he works in your life? And then are you willing ultimately to trust him? So here's the heart of the matter. As God reveals himself to us in the desert, let us choose to follow him with an uncompromising heart. You see, God's desire, like I said, is to complete this good redemptive work within our lives. And as we take this journey over the next few weeks, I'm going to be honest with you, we're going to learn a lot about our own character. We're going to learn a lot about our propensities as human beings. There's a lot we're going to learn that can keep us from God's very best in our lives. But we're also going to see and be reintroduced to a wonderful God, a sovereign God, a loving, caring God, who is actually willing to do whatever it takes to get our attention and to again fulfill and complete that good work he has started within each of us. So let's not be stubborn in this season, let's not settle in this season, but let's be a people who commit with each other and with our God to trust. I want to encourage you, God is present with you right there in your home today. Wherever you are watching this, wherever you are gathered today, understand that God is present with you. I believe with all my heart he is longing to reveal himself to you right now. The Spirit of God wants to meet you right where you are. The Word of God wants to take root in your heart today. Will you trust? Will you allow him? So I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward to our weeks together uh, through, this, through this lens, through this digital medium. Uh, it's not quite the same as being in person. But praise God, we can still gather like this. 
and together begin to explore and experience all that God wants to accomplish in and through us as we go through this journey in our own desert, so to speak. So let me pray for us, and then I'm looking forward already to bringing next week's talk. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we again thank you for your word. We thank you for your good work in our hearts and lives. Lord Jesus, for we as your people, as followers of Jesus, we thank you that you are faithful and good to complete that which you have started in our lives. Lord, again, we pray, help us not to settle, help us to trust and believe that, Lord God, you want your very best for us as you conform us into the image of your Son, and we look to keep living in light of eternity. Lord God, help us to trust, settle our hearts, continue to mold and shape us, we pray, in the image of your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen.